All right, it's Dan Taylor from appseventscom We are actually hijacking Chris Ducker's office for another episode of Tropical Talk Radio. Let's get it moving. Yeah, buddy, you've downloaded Tropical Talk Radio, where we talk about all things entrepreneurship, travel, and lifestyle. If you're interested in more about this program, check out tropicalmba.com. And if you sign up for our mailing list, I will personally send you 50 free podcast episodes that take you along on our journey and expose the insider story on how we started a million-dollar, honest-to-goodness product business while we traveled the globe. Hi, Dan. Crazy to see you here in Cebu City. Actually, I had no idea you were going to be here. I saw you on the DC. It's, it's weird how we keep bouncing into each other. Like, it's isn't it true. Cool? It's true. Last time I was in the uh, Philippines, you were here as well, but we didn't meet. And then I just randomly got an email from you after I did a DC post, and here we are. What so are you doing cool. here? What's the backstory? I've got a VA in the Philippines. I recruited through Chris Ducker, and I'm recruiting a, a second uh, VA as well right now. So I'm here w- spending a week working with my VA. And recruiting a second person. So has it been worth it to come out here? It's, it's been amazing. It's been a really great experience. I recommend anyone who's got a VA, you know, to hang out and spend a week with them. Just just get to meet. I've, I've never met Vonne until I came here. So it's great just to spend a week and actually meet her as a person, you know. All right. So some backstory. You spoke at DC Berlin. Yeah. I had no idea who you were. <laughs> Uh, and your track record is incredibly impressive. You are partnering with uh, my entrepreneurial uh, dream man. Uh, how, <laughs> how do you say it? Uh, Rob Walling, one of my favorite people yeah. on the internet. You're helping them great. put on MicroConf in Prague. Yeah. Uh, you started this Apps Events business, yeah. uh, appsevents.com, which, just take my word for it, extremely successful right out of the gate. Uh, I'm blown away by what you're doing in terms of profitability, in terms of throwing great events. And that's what we're going to talk about on this show today is how you can crush it throwing live events for your audience. You've got some amazing tips. I mean, even us, we've probably done six or seven events with my company and you're schooling me. Uh, so yeah. that's that's why I brought you here today. Well, cheers, man. But I'd also like to say as well, I mean, DC Berlin was probably the most fun event I've been to as well. So you've definitely got the fun aspect <laughs> kind of your events. I had, I had a better time at your events than I have at mine, so, you know. Well, yeah, let's talk a, a little bit about you yeah. before we get into the event tips and tricks. Um, you know, I think you've had a crazy career, right? You, you, you had a, a staffing business that you sold, then you yeah. had a software business. Before that, you were a management consultant. Exactly. I think from the outside, you would look like an opportunist, like a, a hustler and a deal maker. but getting to know you, you're not like that at all. You're very enterprising, so... How, how is it that you're getting into all these different kinds of opportunities? You know, like it's funny, we haven't really talked about this. Things came along in a strange way, you know. I studied engineering. I got into consulting just because I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And, and it looked like an interesting thing where I could travel different countries, get to learn a bit about business because I had no business experience uh, at all. So I transitioned from being a consultant to being a freelancer. So I was already kind of kind of self-employed. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was based in Prague. I worked for Deloitte. I was in Prague. And I had a really good mate, Mike, uh, an Aussie guy. And it was 2004. Czech Republic was joining the European Union. And we just started brainstorming. We were both kind of sick of just working, trading hours for dollars. And we're thinking about business. And we all thought, you know, European Union has got to be some business opportunities. What, what is it? And then we thought, hang on, maybe people from the Czech Republic, they can now work in the UK. They couldn't before. So maybe there's an, an opportunity that we start recruiting people from Czech. Uh, work in the UK and this was straight opportunism you know um, as it happened what and we, we, that was our, our, our business idea but what actually happened was the Czech economy started booming everybody started setting up these shared service centers in Prague right. so that, so that the, the, the money was actually recruiting in Prague you know and we started recruiting the same kind of people that I used to be I was an SAP consultant so started recruiting these IT people so that was straight opportunism uh, what I kind of realized then was that I hated the recruitment business, you know, and, I, and, I, and that's what I, I learned, you know, like I, I really just, just didn't like it. And, 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 and now I, I swore I'd never get into anything again, just, just for an opportunity, you know, and I, and I managed to sell that business. I talked a bit about it at, 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 at a DC and then the software business was a funny one because when I was a, a consultant, there was a guy I worked for a German guy who's a really good friend of mine and he'd been working for, um, lots of different businesses and he was generally the project manager and everywhere he'd go he'd recruit me you know it was great right. and so I worked for him in the Caribbean and Hong Kong and all over cool places and, and he'd got a job at Google 
And I knew that after, after the recruitment agency, I wanted to get back into kind of the IT world. I mean, that was kind of a general thing, but I, I didn't know what. I didn't want to go back to SAP because I'd, I'd done that for eight years. And he was like, look, why don't you set up a business relating to Google? I can introduce you to the guys. You know, you can set up an application. And that was kind of the reason I started looking at, at Google. And in, in the beginning, uh, I was looking at just doing a straight consulting business, you know, like services. But, but we, we got a couple of consulting clients in education, and then we figured out, hang on a minute, we can develop an application. Actually, one of our clients asked us for some functionality, so we developed the app for this client who was already paying us. Now, why sell out of that business so early? First off, the business did precisely what? It allowed universities to create courses on a Google App Engine. Exactly, yeah, uh, and schools as well. I mean, we had a, Eton was a customer. It's you know the school where Prince William and Harry went to in the UK. So um, why, why flip it? We weren't, see, it was making good money, but it was more the structure of the company. There was three of us. I started the business. I was a majority shareholder, but I had two partners. One right. was the guy I had the first business with, who was still a good mate of mine. And another guy, a guy from Belarus, who was a, was a Python programmer. And, and th- those two guys had other projects. I see. Mike was still running the original business. Ale has got a consulting client in the US. So they were kind of, they, they were only devoting part of their time to it. Um, you know, we 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 so went it's tricky in that kind of partnership yeah. arrangement because if you put in tons of effort, yeah, you feel like your equity stake stake should go up. Yeah, no, that that well, actually that wasn't really the, the problem. The problem was, you know, um, it was making some money, but it wasn't making enough to do a full time income so that these two guys could give up their regular jobs. I see. We weren't really, you know, we 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 set up. We went through every option. We went through: do we join an incubator? Do we get venture capital funding? Do we hire someone? Uh, and then we went through the whole, let, let's, why don't we just see if we can sell the business, you know, because it's got to a certain level. We all had, I, I'd already organized a conference by this time. So I had this, I was starting to think about the events business, oh, you know, I'd done one event, made some money out of it. And, 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 you know, so I was thinking, well, actually I could probably make money. And your events are basically centered around a similar idea that you had with the software company, which is people that want to utilize Google App Engine can come to your events to learn more about it. Yeah, well, my, my events basically, that I run them for Google. I'm kind of a Google education partner. So I'm running events where attendees come from schools and universities who are using Google Apps, but all sorts of things, not just Google Apps, like the sessions on Chromebooks, on using Google Maps and Google Earth in education. Like I just had an event in Prague a month ago when we had the whole Google Earth team come across to Prague and did a whole session on using Map Engine Lite and stuff. A couple of DC so this guys business came is, along. Is it brand new, right? Brand new, brand new. And the how first many event events are you going to run in the next 12 months? Next 12 months, um, well, 15 already scheduled, but it's going to be about 20, uh, 20 plus. Right. <laughs> it's going just, quick. Just let that sink in just a little bit. So you're off and, and freaking running. Yeah. I'm curious, you know, you've been living a lifestyle that I admired a long time before I got into the game. How is it that you that you work? We were talking a little bit about, yeah. you know, you're always bouncing around. It's always an airplane, a hotel. I mean, are you getting sick of that? Or do you feel like that's your energy? Or what's what's your kind of mindset about, about the lifestyle? You know, like I was saying to you before, you know, the funny thing with me is I think, because uh, I, I started off working for a consultancy and when you work for a management consultancy um, you know you work a month here six months here and you had a new desk and you meet new people so that's I've, I've never known anything else in my life the only time I had any stability was running the recruitment agency when I was in an office all the time and that pissed me off to be honest <laughs> like I don't know if we can swear on the podcast but like I, I realized I, I, I think to answer your question I think I prefer the energy of of being in the place, you know, and and, and I think it's something. I mean, you said something which I think is true. I think it's something. It's like a, like a learned behavior, you know. I think I did that for so many years. And now it's normal. I stick my laptop down. I stick my headphones on. I've got my Gmail screen, and that's I'm at work, you know. So I, I think I prefer I prefer the the randomness. I, you know, I don't have. I've got a home office, but you know, I, I never use it really. You know, and you're based out of Prague. Based right? out of Prague, but okay. I, you know, I'm tra- I travel a lot. Absolutely. So okay, me and you. We both throw events, yep. but the difference between me and you is that you throw profitable events. <laughs> so that's why you're on this podcast well, today. I want to talk about it's how my own I'm business. You know, it's 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 become. A, I guess it's a side thing for the DC, isn't it? Yeah, you, you're focusing on a great experience, but yeah. But but I want to learn. I mean, I think a lot of people could. I mean, these events are fantastic. People love them. They're great products to it's have. True. Let's talk about how we can improve uh, my events. I'll cool. just use this as free consulting. Um, So you mentioned that events have this really simple structure, which I liked how you break it down. So let us know about the structure. Yeah, I mean, 
just very simply, you know, you've, with, a, with, with running an event, you've essentially got two costs and two revenue sources, you know, and, and, and don't try to complicate it beyond this. I mean, your costs are the cost of the venue mm -hmm. and the cost of getting your speakers there. Um, there's actually a third cost of, of marketing, but essentially if, if you're using sort of contacts and online, that's, that's not a huge one. But basically cost of your venue and cost of your, of your speakers. And then your revenue is, is money from sponsors or exhibitors, depends what you call them, mm -hmm. and money from ticket sales for, for attendees. Okay. So, you know, uh, do you want to talk about the revenue side of it first? Or? Uh, let, I have a point. There's five things that you mentioned to me that kind of blew me away. <laughs> and even on event number seven, I didn't know about. So I'm going to ask you about those five things, and then you can cool. sort of tack on anything. Cool. Uh, so first off is how to structure the deal with hotels. And you were mentioning that, you know, I found hotels to be very uh, inflexible. It's almost yeah. like they're, they're stone marble artifices and it's, this is the contract and that's that. No, but you're saying there's more flexibility. You, you can negotiate a lot, a lot with hotels. It depends kind of how much, how much you're using them as well. I mean, one of the common things that's quite common uh, in Europe is you can say to a hotel, look, hotels generally have what's called a DDR, a delegate day rate, and that's, they're going to charge you $50 per person for a conference space. And that includes... You know, lunch, the cookies, and yeah, the coffee. cookies, coffee, AV equipment. They'll always try to say Wi-Fi is extra. They'll always try to say this is extra. First thing is, you know, no, this is the DDR. We want Wi-Fi included. We want projector included. We want radio microphone included. You know, mm -hmm. you just got to go through everything because the first thing they'll do, it's like, it's like, you know, in publishing, they say there's a dummy contract. They, they give you the dummy contract first, which only a dummy would sign, but then you can <laughs> negotiate the real contract, you know, and it's the same with hotels. You just got to say, no, 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 no. It's obviously supply and demand, you know. If you're in a city like Prague where there's tons of hotels, you can negotiate a lot because, because there's a lot of competition for, for hotels. If you're in a city where there's only a few good hotels, it, it's harder, you know. But you can do that. You know, you can quite often get hotels to say, look, they'll give you a percentage of the room rate for all your attendees, you know. So Is that what they care about more than the DDR? I mean, where's the most... Prop. It seems to me like the room block is the thing they care the most about. Yeah, I, I, I would say that's my experience, you know. But, you know, you can generally just negotiate. You can say, look, if we bring you this many rooms, we want, you know, a, a reduced DDR. You know, you can even get, you can even pay nothing for the venue if, if enough people stay there. I know companies like Marcus Evans who run thousands of events, they go to hotels and say, you know, uh, we're just going to book 300 rooms and we want the venue for free with the catering for free you know wow. that's an extreme example but for sure you can either get a percentage of the, of the room rate back to you or you can negotiate a, a discount on the on the on the ddr so you know? so i think that's interesting because i guess um you know what what that kind of deal does is it makes you deliver yeah. right so you only get paid then on the rooms that you deliver to them yeah whereas so that makes sense to me Definitely. Yeah. And, and remember that the, the, the rate you're paying, the rate you're paying to hire the venue, the, the DDR, that's, that's, you're not charging that to your attendees. That's just included in the ticket price. You're right. charging $500. It's costing you 100 for the venue. I got it. But the other venue thing as well, Dan, is... Um, so most times, by the way, so sorry. to clarify, but when you run an event, generally your attendees will pay a price that you pre-negotiated with the hotel. No, no. Normally you will pay that yourself. So let's say you're coming to my conference, yeah? You're uh -huh. paying $500. I'm paying the $50 a day to the hotel. Correct, but not yeah. my hotel room. No, you're paying the hotel room yourself. Right. On checkout. Exactly. Perfect. And you can negotiate, you know, so let's say that they've got a rate and they'll give you a rate that's cheaper than their regular rate. You know, you can sometimes agree a percentage of that room rate to yourself. Got it. Or you can get that as a discount on your, on your DDR. Any other tips with negotiating with hotels? Um... Always try to get another offer. It's the same standard negotiation. If you go to another hotel and you can always say, hang on a minute, these guys are saying $40, you're saying $50 and they're giving me free cookies or whatever. You know? <laughs> Just like you know, always, always go to multiple, always go to multiple hotels. All right. So number two. Um, you have some tips on how to get sponsors. So yeah. I've never can had Can I just add one quick thing, Dan, as yeah. well? Um, on venues, also look at free venues. You know, quite often if you can hold it so maybe a university We'll let you hold the event there. Maybe if, if you're going to do some deal, we're letting some of their students come to your event and things. Just as a side point, have a look at that because sometimes you can get events for free. It doesn't have to be in a hotel, you know? That's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. I love that move. Um, probably wouldn't work for the DC events, yeah. but it would work for a lot of other yeah, kinds yeah, of things yeah. I can think about. So, okay. Um, let's talk about sponsors. Yeah. I've never contacted a sponsor. Yeah. Um, how does that work? I mean, what are, you, what are these? Why are people going to pay me money just to put a billboard up uh, how does it work yeah no i mean generally the events i've done i can only really talk about you you've normally got a, a small exhibitors area where 
the, the sponsors will have a desk and mm-hmm. maybe they're standing signs. And, and, you know, in the coffee breaks, you'll normally put the exhibitors close to the coffee and food area. They get to interact with, with the attendees as well. You know, you, you can make different levels of sponsorship. You know, you can say, you know, platinum level is they get to present a session at the summit. Um, you know, gold level. So you're creating really arbitrary packages. Basically. Really arbitrary, exactly. And, and, and again, and, and one thing we talked about is, you know, don't, don't put the web prices on your website because you can negotiate. If, if it's a big company, they've got a big budget, you can negotiate more. So, okay, sponsorship. let's talk about the sales process then. Yeah. You know, how do you approach them with this stuff? And you, you've got your packages. Say, here's yeah. my platinum level. It's yeah. a thousand bucks. How do you, how does the sales process go down? Yeah, I mean, there's, unfortunately, what's I don't... Their, well, let me, yeah. What's their motivation? What, I mean, do they really think that they're going to get a lot of customers out of it, or do they feel like they've got to spend their marketing budget? Or, you know, you know it, it, it's both. For big companies, they've got a whole... They'll have a whole, they'll have a whole event subdivision of their marketing division, right. and they've got a budget, and all they've got to do is, is brand awareness and getting to millions of events. You know, for smaller companies, they actually... I mean, for my events, we have companies, they... You know, they're paying $1,000 to come to my event. They want to make $1,000 plus a business from people at the event, you know. So I think your, both your points are correct. The big companies, they just want brand awareness and they've got a budget and they're going to spend it. The smaller companies, you know, they're actually looking to, to get to get customers, you know. By the way, if you're listening to this podcast episode because, you know, you're sort of quizzically wondering why the hell you're listening to two guys talk about events, yeah. which is sort of esoteric a little bit. Yeah. I would just like to position this before we get to these other tips as a really great business opportunity because I think, you know, more and more people have more flexibility in their time and their location so they can get to events. Yeah. People are loving events. A lot of people are working from home. Yeah. Um, and I also, I've been to a lot of events and they yeah. suck. Yeah. There's the so shows. much opportunity to do good shit. Like exactly. really freaking good events that are really focused on whatever it is. But yeah, and, yeah. and the numbers are really compelling. I mean, you can make a good, this can be a business. And I, I've yeah. heard a lot of people running mediocre conferences in the United States absolutely drive into them in Mercedes Benz. Yeah. I mean, this is, can be profitable. And, and, you, and you talk a lot about, and you, you guys on the podcast about the hustle. This, but this is a business where you've got to be a hustler. You know, you can't, you can't do this business. As if you're a guy who likes to code and not get on the phone and not chase. You know, this is this is the hustling, hustlingest of the hustle All right. jobs, you know. Hey, you got a great tip about um, tickets. You were saying have different pricing levels for people who act early. Explain yeah. to me the philosophy here. I've never done this. Well, the philosophy is you start off with events. You know, it doesn't matter if it's a training event, a conference, whatever. They always have like some kind of early bird price, you know, some sort of early, for people who come in early. And, and this is, you want to use this to kind of get started. So, for example, with MicroConf Europe, you know, we've, we've got a list of DC, we had a DC people, uh, Rob and Mike have some people, and you have an early bird price, you know. And then and this is to sort of to get to get going, and you can kind of gauge, gauge the interest then. I mean, what you can sometimes do is you don't even need to decide in advance what your main price is going to be. You can just say, here's our early bird price, and we're going to, on the 2nd of April, we're going to increase the price to this. And you can look at your early bird price, and if it's selling really fast, you can think, well, you know, maybe the early bird's 200, maybe we can go for 700. You know, if it's going slow, then maybe it's just 250, you know? You know what? The reason that this, if, if you haven't yet thrown an event, the reason that this resonated with me so much is that unlike e products or info products or all that, yeah. you've got a real inventory issue when it comes to these events. Exactly. And it, what this does is it gives you flexibility to increase your profitability if you know you're going to sell the event out. Yeah, exactly. So it's just an inventory issue, right? It is. It so, is. You, so I love this idea because it gives you that flexibility to either say, hell, you could reduce the price. Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. <laughs> or whatever it takes, or maybe you have to give away whatever it takes. But that I think this is really smart. Yeah, I, I mean, reducing the price would be difficult, but you could not increase it. You could keep it the same. Correct. I mean, you, you're going to annoy people Good who point. paid that money. That's one thing you can't really do. But you, but you, you don't have to increase it. You can say, okay, we're going to extend our early bird offer. And then yes. after a while, you just gradually remove the word early bird from your website and it's just a price. You know? Because if you've got a room that fits 100 people and you yeah. sell 80 tickets, it's a tragedy. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah, you know yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, and, and this yeah. gives you that flexibility. And, yeah. and then and then the other thing is if, you're, if you've sold 80 tickets in a day, yeah. then you want to double the price and sell Definitely. those 20 tickets at double the price. Yeah, exactly. It's brilliant. Absolutely. And also, you know, don't be scared to do bulk deals. If someone calls you up or emails you, we're going to send 20 people. 
you know, you you work out what your costs are, the cost of your you know your overall cost, and then anything above that is is cheddar, you know. So yeah. so don't be scared to to agree bulk deals to get, you know, because because remember, even if you get some people in for free, that keeps the sponsors happy, and you've got two customers really, you've got your sponsors and your attendees. If if you've got sponsors, you know, you don't have to, if you've got them. So sometimes you might want people in cheap to keep the sponsors happy, because then they get to meet a lot of people. They're happy. They want to come next year. You know. I see. All right. The issue with speakers. So let's yeah. talk about speakers. Last year, when I announced that Derek Sivers, for example, was coming to the event, yeah. it changed the quality of the event quite a bit, both yeah. in terms of the way people looked at you know, how cool it was going to be, yeah, yeah. and also on the sales. The, the event totally sold out. Yeah. I mean, I don't know it how... It would have sold out anyway, because you've got the DC, I guess. But. Yeah, I, I don't. we don't look at it that closely, but yeah. at the end of the day, if you've got Derek Sivers coming to your event, that's awesome. You know? sure, sure. So how do you deal with these speakers issue? How do you think about speakers, and, and how much do you have to compensate people and all that? Yeah, I mean, the thing is, it's it's important to get a couple of good names in early. You know, Once, once people look at the website and they see Derek Sivers, that's, that's a great example. You know, If you get these guys in early then it's going to give your early ticket sales a boost. So you want to focus on getting one or two people. But, you know, like I for said... For MicroConf, for example, did you guys pre-range speakers? Uh, MicroConf's different because in, in that case, I'm dealing with the sponsors and, and Rob, uh, the other guys, are dealing with, with the speakers. Okay. But for my other events, I'm dealing with the speakers myself. And um, I always try to get one or two people in, in early. And then, then see, you know, it depends on the sales. If you're getting a lot of people in, you might get some more big names in. But you always want to keep down the cost of these speakers as much as possible. You know, you don't want to, a lot of the reason conferences don't make too money is paying too much to speakers, paying too much for speaker expenses. Um, and, and, you know, you can get around that by things like, you know, if, a, if someone's promoting a book or, or whatever, or they're in your area, you can quite often get them to come for free if they've got a reason to, to be there, you know? Right. If someone's not specifically promoting something, you've got to give them a reason to get on a plane and come to your conference, and you've probably got to pay them a, a fee. But if you get someone who's on the book promotion cycle, there's a good chance they will just want to come and speak at your event, you know, just for expenses. So do you, how do you know how much to offer them? So do you have to fly people business class? Like, does it, is this completely flexible? Yeah, it I, I, I never do. I, 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 I always focus on local people. So, for example, if I'm running an event, I run events in Asia, in, in Europe. If, I, if I'm doing one in, in Europe, I'll try to get European people. Right. Because then it's, there's lots of cheap airlines. Never pay for business class. Um, you pay for the hotel? Generally, well, generally, so you lead with not always. Offer, you say, by like, the way, I've, I'll I've, pay I've, you. I've had I've had speakers who've paid to come to the conference and they've paid for their own hotel. That's the starting point. And then I've had speakers who I've paid for their hotel. Then the next one is paid for their hotel, pay for their transport. And right. Then final. So, there's no rule here, right? Because I, I'd like to point it's out, all negotiation. I have never paid for anything for a speaker. Yeah. So uh, we're changing that policy, by the way, yeah. because our speakers are putting so much energy. And I just thank you publicly, by the way. Your speech was awesome, and it helped us to sell our business. Yeah, and I paid to come. I was you, paying attention. You have a, br- a broad skill set. I appreciate your mentorship because we use some of the things that you said to help sell our our uh, industrial cool. drop shipping site. Glad to hear it. But now you're here informing us, schooling us on the, on the event stuff. So uh, this speakers thing is interesting. I do like the idea that, uh, I mean... A lot of it is speaking is an inherently a valuable thing. Yeah, having the, so you don't necessarily need to pay anybody anything. No, and I like what you said about you know you've got you, your original things. You didn't even pay expenses. I mean that's you know that's your starting point is not paying anything. You know, but you, but you do need one or two people pretty early committed to the conference so you can start selling tickets for it. You know, so unless with the DC you've got a different example. You've got a People know there's going to be interesting people, so they'll come. But if you take a regular public example, they don't. They want to see someone if a, speaking. If a conference has a mission, um, like if you look at like certain like uh, Word WordPress conferences or something, yeah, yeah, yeah. if your conference has like it, it means something in the world, it's possible that you could convince. You know, a lot of the attendees are going to want to speak sure, and stuff sure, like that. Sure. So exactly, and, and that's always a point. You know, and it's a little bit different, I guess, if it's like come here and become an AdWords expert. Yeah, that's a little bit tougher than come here and figure out how to evangelize WordPress. Yeah, exactly. I agree. I agree totally. So build in some why into your, <laughs> into your conferences. Yeah, and, 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 always, and don't, start, don't start off too high. Don't start offering flights and hotels when you can, pro- when, you know, if this person was going to come anyway, you know, start off from the, from the basic point. Yes, I've gotten some offers for speaking, and it, it, they always do leave tons of waffle room in the yeah, initial yeah, email. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe so they even play on your conscience a little bit. Like maybe 
you know, I could maybe this or yeah, yeah. I mean, there's, there's inter- you know, South by Southwest, that's one of the biggest, most successful conferences in the US. They don't pay speakers, huh. which is amazing. I just discovered that recently. Hmm. You know, they, they, they send you some, I saw the email they send people, which is, we're going to give you a special free platinum pass, which means you can attend all the events and this is worth $3,000 and da, da, da. Interesting. Yeah, are, there, so. are, there, are there businesses doing this that you look up to? Are there people that you're taking guidance from? You know, I'm, I'm trying to find that. It's such a new business. I've just figured most of this out, out myself, mm-hmm. you know. But there's companies like Marcus Evans and they run tons of, of events and um, – and a few, a few like that. And, 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 I, and I look at specific events I admire, like South by Southwest and some of these huge events. So that's kind of, that's the next league up for me, you know, something. I mean, that's that's 10 leagues up for me, to be honest. But that's kind of what I'd like to be getting into also some, some of these party. bigger events. Like, yeah, 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 for sure. Look, so, so a lot of people are, are going to maybe say, I see the opportunity in meetings. I, I know that they all suck because cool people aren't doing <laughs> these businesses for whatever reason. Cool people are uh, making tumblers of the world but yeah. or whatever. Uh, but they're thinking, okay, I want to live this travel lifestyle. I can't run a conference business. I mean, you're the one of the biggest travel guys I know. So how does that work out in your brain? Well, yeah, I think you can. I mean, it all depends. Like, if, if you're a person who can work efficiently and travel, you can do it. I mean, the thing about this business is you're probably going to be, if you're running multiple events, you're probably going to be traveling a bit anyway because you have to be, generally be at your events until you scale do you? To a at level. what point can you stop going to the events? Well, think- this is the point I think I'm, I want to get to by the end of the year is is to be not going to all my events. Uh, that's that's kind of a target of mine for the end of the year. Because, but but it, it depends really. I think if if you structure it properly and get in a good uh, a good kind of project manager, event event manager. Uh, that you could get up pretty quickly, I guess. Yeah, and I would think that this is not a hard position to hire for. Who doesn't want to be an event manager for an international conference company running around? It's true, it's true. And, and like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at recruiting, uh, recruiting a, a sort of manager to replace a lot of my roles uh, pretty soon. Absolutely. So, yeah, you're going surfing next week. Exactly. Surfing all next week and then a uh, quick trip to Hong Kong and then back to Prague. I'm actually going to Hong Kong too. Cool. I just got an email this morning. So Dan, thank you so much for the mentorship you're providing for uh, our group. Cheers, it's Dan. been awesome, and uh, uh, I just love the serendipity that happens <laughs> in this. I, you know, this it's a small world. It is a small world, and I just love. Um, I think that's part of what draws me to this kind of thing so much is that everybody's. It's a positive attitude. It's people are really doing stuff. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. the things that you say into this microphone and stuff end up really mattering for a lot of people because I guarantee you someone's going to go set up in a freaking event company because of the Yeah, I, I hope they do and drop me an email I'll answer any questions. Cheers. Well, it's dan at uh, appsevents.com. Correct. All right. Thanks, Dan. Cheers, Dan. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. Don't be shy. We've got a mailing list. Check it out at tropicalmba.com. Get yourself signed up and we'll keep you up to date on everything we do. Plus, give you those 50 free podcast episodes. If you want to say, hey, check me out on Twitter at Tropical MBA. We'll see you soon.